Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesday. It's the first video of 2022. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm like, what do I have on my desk? Uh, it was a bit difficult to get back in and get in the mindset for video content because I've been doing the survey forms for uh, Boss Fight Song of Sparkle Muffin. And so expect to see those in uh, your inboxes, whatever address you use for Kickstarter check there uh because that's gonna be coming you probably already have it um as you're watching this video um of course it's a new year new time to become a patron that's a crappy segue but help support this channel become a monthly patron patreon.com slash liana k this video i'm gonna talk about probably won't get a ton of traffic because i'm actually well maybe some people will get angry at me because i'm actually going to compliment jason schreier for a decent piece of writing what yes i'm really rough on this dude um, because he's built a career on leaks and, um, I thought he was really, really unfair to CD Projekt Red when Cyberpunk was a disaster. Um, not, not in criticizing that Cyberpunk was a disaster, that's totally fair, but he put out multiple articles with next to no new reporting, or in, in one case, no new reporting. Uh, and I was like, there's no new reporting here. You're just basically kicking somebody when they're down for clicks. And he blocked me on Twitter. But he did an article uh, yesterday about Ken Levine of Bioshock fame and his new studio. Um, and it's an interesting piece of writing. And so I want to take you guys through it. Now, part of the reason I'm vouching for this article is that the details I can confirm are um, like 99% accurate as far as I know. I will point out a few factual errors that, uh, you know, ju just for f so that you can trust me when I say, no, this other stuff is correct. But again, again, the interesting thing about the article is the fact that anybody who knows anybody who worked at Irrational Games there is not really a single new piece of information about Ken Levine, how he works, and his flaws as a manager. Um, and this, I think, in part, is a sign that gaming is finally truly maturing as an industry. That no longer is crunch seen as a badge of pride. Um, you know, Bioware magic isn't thing you isn't something you hear talked about um, as often anymore because you know there was Andromeda and then there was Anthem. The Bioware magic lost its mojo um, because Bioware magic worked when you know they were doing uh, fairly simple in in, in terms of. You know, they were not simple for the time and, and, and the Baldur's Gate games, etc. were not small in terms of dialogue and story and all that stuff. But that's all they focused on was dialogue and story. The combat systems were basically a various edition of Dungeons and Dragons. You know, the game did all the dice roll math for you and then they just made stories. Something can come together at the 11th hour when you've got one massive variable. With games now, especially AAA or even some of these, you know, AA or Indie Plus type games, um, you really have to control variables. You can't have amazing graphics and uh, this really innovative gameplay thing and all that stuff. And, 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 you know, I say this as somebody who is making a game and decided we were just going to go super duper total retro graphics because that minimizes that thing right? Partially, we like the JRPG structure, but also, I mean, yes, we're doing custom battle sprites and all that stuff, but we are not reinventing the wheel on graphics because we want to do other stuff. More on that in a bit. But part of that choice was because uh, I have worked for people and, you know, my, my uh, art music director, Mary Just, has, has worked on teams, some of them the same teams. Uh, that did 
what Ken Levine does as a developer and his name came up a lot in these rooms and every time it happened I was like because it's been known for a while that people have to come in at the 11th hour and, and save games like Bioshock Infinite that, you know, were pretty much on fire. Um, and, the you know, the original Bioshock was not at all what the original concept was. That one came together quite late. Um, and there's nothing wrong with taking a game and then deciding you're going to make something different with it. You have to set a point where this is the game we're going to make because the best game is a shipped game. Uh, and it may not be the greatest game in the whole world. It may actually be mediocre. But you finish it, you get it out the door, you get some money coming in, so you move on to the next thing. And unfortunately, too often... I think people feel like everything has to capture that, you know, shock of the new, it's called, of that first hit. The thing is, you go back and look at the original Bioshock, it was the story and, and the art direction of that game that, that really, and the way the story was told, the voice acting, really, I, I think the voice acting really doesn't get enough credit in that game because all you had is little portraits right and listening to people talk while you're going around the combat was fun you know the combination of weapons and the whole atom like the the eve spells things but plasmids that's what they're called right but there was really no difficulty per se because you just regenerated at a vats chamber and maybe lost a clip of ammo but that's it it was a very very easy game and some people were absolutely fine with that. Some people, like me, felt it was sort of, ah, there was a little bit of an unsatisfying feeling to it because you realized fairly quickly there's no difficulty in this game. But overall, it's a classic, right? But it's not perfect. And that's what I think the different, what happens to these guys when they have a hit. You know, we see it with Naughty Dog, as well once they get a hit and once they become as jason schreier calls it in this article an auteur they start putting too much pressure on themselves and end up uh making everyone around them miserable and there's huge staff turnover and so on and so forth whereas other um other very very good developers whose names you don't necessarily know because they just work and work and work and work and work. You know, they just, they go on to this, they do this, they do this, and and they don't become big celebrities and they, there isn't this cult of personality around them, but they get shit done. And uh, those seem to be the people that make really reliable games and those are the people that, you know, come in at the 11th hour and save something like Bioshock Infinite. Um... But uh, so here's the article and basically the next video game from Bioshock's auteur is in development hell. Um, and I'll link to it. But basically it talks about what's been known about Ken Levine for years is that he is uh, prone to throwing out massive amounts of work like half a game through the development cycle. There's apparently no fixed like necessary completion date on uh, his upcoming project. Um, they talk about the fact that he, it, the company now is called Ghost Story Games. His company used to be called Irrational Games. Apparently he fired everybody at Irrational Games so he could start up a smaller company. I'm not sure why you just didn't downsize, but maybe because there were partners on Irrational. But you'll see, you know, people saying he's a hard person to work for. Um, he works more like a Hollywood screenwriter or even a Hollywood filmmaker than a game developer. And, and those are very, very, very different things because um, a reshoot on a film. Okay. Unless it's, you know, the justice league movie where Joss Whedon reshot like half the freaking movie. That's not a reshoot. That's a do over. And somebody should have said no, but reshoots are essentially part of the process you know there are going to be some but 
it is far less difficult to do some reshoots on a movie than implement an entirely new feature in a game at the very last minute, precisely because, you know, when you implement new things in games, you put in something new, something else breaks. Over the holidays, we did an update on Song of Sparkle Muffin for, you know, the the, the game building tools, and it broke our lighting plug-in. <laughs> so I was like, shit. <laughs> um, that's what happens in a game. And we have I have worked on teams where you have the top guy believe it's a commitment to excellence and, you know, pull pull all this stuff out and the team does it but everybody's like fuck um everybody gets burned out everybody gets really overworked it's an unpleasant experience and a lot of the time if the game comes out at all most of the time it doesn't when somebody does this whose name isn't Ken Levine or Neil Druckmann um but when it does it's usually actually not great because those great games that came out through the process are actually the exceptions, not the rule. For every game that survived that process and came out like a flawed masterpiece like the original Bioshock, um, you get games that just don't get finished because the project runs out of money. Uh, you have to manage a video game more like a... More like building an add-on to a house or something like that, or building a house, you have to have blueprints and you have to have those blueprints approved. And at the last minute, you can change, you know, a coat of paint, you know, or you can change a trim or you can even change, you know, non-structural where walls go. You can put in little half walls, but the basic structure of the house, you know, you can't start knocking out supporting walls um, it, or your house falls down. And, you know, there are different ways that there, there are as, as many ways to manage this as there are developers. A guy like Ken Levine, a guy like Neil Druckmann doesn't do those things because they don't have to, because they get special treatment from the their parent companies, you know, from Sony um, and, and from Take-Two. You know, most game developers do not get the deals that these guys do you know the fact that sony apparently just had an unlimited tap of money on the last of us 2 so they could you know do a, a cable mechanic that move more like the rope than a rope than a cable because it seems so light but oh yeah really interesting physics on that you know noodly thing you're moving around but you use it three four times in the game those dog search mechanics there's a couple levels with that. You know, it's not it's not like something like Far Cry 6 that I've been playing uh, over the weekend. And uh, I love the Far Cry games. More on that in another video. But, uh, you know, those things have to get used again and again and again and again and again. Um, they really got to sing. They got to be really, really, really refined. And to me, the Far Cry series, in many ways, is the pinnacle of AAA gaming. Maybe I'll talk more about that on Feedback Friday if you're interested in hearing more about why I think the Far Cry series is sort of the gold standard for AAA games in a lot of ways. Um, but getting back to what I said, most most developers, even in AAA, do not have the luxuries that Neil Druckmann and Ken Levine do. Um, you know, when Cliff Blazinski was making Gears of War, he didn't have an infinite amount of time. The three, the the three four three guys, the Coalition now, they don't have infinite amount of time. You know, they they have deadlines and they have milestones, and those are money makers for Microsoft. You know, in in the case of um, uh, Gears of War and, and Halo, you know, it was a big deal. When, what the fuck's it even called? Infinite? Legendary? I've lost track of it. But the latest Halo game, it was a big deal that it got pushed and they still put out multiplayer to give people something. Because that's a tentpole. You can't just, well, the game will come out when it comes out when you're working on Halo or you're working on Gears. Right? You just can't. There's too much money on the line. Now, Ken Levine does say in this article that that uh, Jason Schreier wrote that uh, it's a quote. He, said, he didn't talk to Jason Schreier for the article. 
Um, this this was a public quote, but um, you know, talked about the fact that uh, Ghost Story Games is a rounding error on um, uh, on uh, Take Two's balance sheet. Um, so yeah, sure, whatever. They're willing to let him fart around and burn money because they want another Bioshock. I think that's similar to what Sony does with Naughty Dog. They let them burn money because they're like, well, we can do a HBO uh, series of The Last of Us. I don't have high hopes for that, by the way. I just don't. Um, again, if you're interested in hearing me talk about why I think The Last of Us, the first Last of Us was a great video game. I think it will make a shitty television series. If you're interested, let me know. Um, but, uh, um, you know, then there's the, you know, uh, Uncharted that's going to be a movie with Tom Holland. You know, I love Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg. I love Mark Wahlberg less. Um, but that's what they want. They want those IPs that can go all over the place because the profits on movies are so much higher than video games. Just, uh, you know, you just make them. You make more money per blockbuster. They're probably looking at Spider-Man and going, hey, billion dollar movie during COVID. We want that. We're willing to burn some money in game development to get that, which is what I really think DC and Marvel should be doing with their actual comic book divisions uh, as an aside. This video is sort of all over the place, but I am getting somewhere um, as I turn off my Telegram notifications. Um as I said, I, have, I haven't spent a lot of time on the Schreier article because I think that it's worth reading. Like, actually read it as an entirety. And I don't want to blow through it. I don't want to just read it. Uh, some of the anecdotes, sort of the history of the company, what happened with Irrational and, and um, uh, you know, the founding of Ghost Story and sort of the pros and cons of what it's like working for Ken Levine. Overall, I think the article is quite fair and worth a read. What I want to say about articles like this is that people like Ken Levine, people like Neil Druckmann don't just wake up one day and decide they're going to be, you know, assholes who don't treat their staff terribly well and result in pretty high staff turnover, you know. Um, a particular frustration for, and, and this is just me reporting, don't get mad at me, don't shoot the messenger on this, but a common complaint you hear among women in the industry is no woman in the game industry could behave the way these guys do. The way they treat people, the way they insist on crunch, the way, you know, people are, are um, suddenly not a good fit or not a team player if they clash with them to, you know, in some cases, try to protect their teams from overwork. Um, but, uh, you know, um, they're allowed to be this by their parent companies. And some people may like working on these projects. Some people may be fine working for a company because you want to work with a guy with this sort of pedigree. You want it on your resume so you can go on and do other things. But, you know, a lot of people don't want to be mistreated in this way. And I think it is important that articles like this that are actually written in a fairly even-handed way and show his um, strengths as well as his weaknesses. You know, they said he can be quite charming and charismatic um, of course, he can also be moody. Now, I'm a little, um, uh, moody is one thing, but the exact detail they gave in this story is that he singles out individuals and berates them in front of their coworkers. That's not just moody, that's potential workplace abuse, right? Like, that's not, I'm in a bad mood, I'm going to close my door and sulk and possibly sleep under my desk. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who actually did that, but, you know, that's one thing. They're in a bad mood. Their blood sugar's low. They miss their meds that morning. They go, they close the door. All right. In a few hours, they're okay. That's moody, right? Um, berating staff in front of everybody is abusive. And as somebody who's been on the receiving end of that in gaming, the problem with that is it doesn't just rattle the person being yelled at. It rattles everybody because everybody knows how wrong it is. You know, um, 
and uh, like this happens in the business because the industry builds up people like Ken Levine. They build up people like Neil Druckmann as auteur game developers. And to me, Hideo Kojima is an auteur game developer. He does weird ass shit, but you don't hear the stories. People, people seem to legitimately like working for him to the point that, you know, when shit went sideways with Konami and he had to scrabble together Death Stranding, he just called in a bunch of favors and, you know, got a bunch of his friends in Hollywood and, and gaming and all that stuff to help him. And I'm sure he has his quirks, you know, but you don't hear about this uh, um, sort of accepted... Hollywood tyrant style behavior in the same way from Japanese studios. Now, there are different issues with Japanese studios. They're not perfect. They have work to do too, but you just don't seem to get the same type of egos with these things. I mean, the thing that people don't seem to like about Ko Ko Kojima, and I, I don't know why, is he's weird. Right, he says these things, he's like, what is this guy talking about? I personally love that, that's what I want. I want people who make games to be kind of weird because then you get a unique perspective in the game. And, you know, I would, I would love to see games being used to tell new types of stories instead of this idea that you know, apparently Ken Levine's experimenting with words different every time. Okay, there are certain things that can be different every time. Different endings. Okay, none of this is new. RPGs have been doing like different endings and everything like that for decades. I, I don't know. Oh, it's a different experience. There's all these dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make different dialogue things. It's just branches, 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 branches. It is not technically difficult. It is just really tough to track because it is all human input and human error and you need you need one producer on every goddamn module on that to make sure it doesn't fly off into shit the minute something's changed you can't have branching 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 dialogue and then start throwing out entire things and making major last changes at the last minute because you completely break shit uh and then you're just squashing bugs ad nauseum um but and then, you know, you're re-recording voice and this and that. And anyway, you know what I mean? Um, I really think the games press has created these beasts to an extent. I have had to sit for years and hear Ken Levine talked about breathlessly as some kind of Jesus of video games. And, and it's never terribly impressed me because I know that so many people with far less fame and far less influence and without the ability to just go in and burn money and take two goes, okay, you're a rounding error. Um, he's taken credit for other people's last minute cleanup work and been lauded as a genius and been unaccountable for that. So, you know, good that these pieces are coming out now. It is notable to me the difference in tone between what was going on with the CD Projekt stories and this Ken Levine story. Now, if that's because Jason Schreier learned from the tone of the CDPR stuff, that would be fantastic because to me, this is actual reporting that gives people sort of an inside look of how the game industries, the industry works and what are some of the problems with these auteur game developers and you know if these guys want to go out and like i said they're all guys because women can't get away with this shit um you know um if they want to go out and make something like disco elysium right that's just an interesting weird story but again it's back on that sort of isometric unity graphics and branching narratives um go for it fart around with that as much as you want keep it as a small team but you know there was a certain humility in scope 
in terms of the mechanics in Disco Elysium, Disco Elysium. same with Elsinore, same with so on and so forth. Um, it, they work because of that. And you can re I mean, you can replay Disco Elysium and never get the same experience twice based on the, you know, the basic plot's the same, but based on the different attributes you pick, you get very, very different dialogue options one point after another. And it's not everybody's thing because it's sort of nihilistic and very, very political. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed it a lot. But again, the technical requirements for that were very small, so they could focus on the story. Whereas guys like Druckmann, guys like Ken Levine, they want all the things because they have all the money. And then pressure gets put on every other game company, you know, no matter how large, no matter how small, they feel the pressure to compete with that. And I'd like that to stop. I'd like, you know people to be able to say, all right, they're them. They're in a category on their own, just like Kojima's in a category on his own. I mean, could anybody else pull off like a Guillermo del Toro meat suit in the shower with Norman Reedus? No, that that is that you you need you need the, the Kojima aesthetic to make that work. People are like, what? Yeah, that happens in Death Stranding. Um, you know, uh, I love Death Stranding. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we need to put guys like Ken Levine, we need to put guys like Neil Druckmann in their proper place in the industry and stop expecting every AAA dev team to make a game that is Bioshock Infinite or The Last of Us 2 because those games were so overhyped. When they came out, I'm sorry, both of them were messes. I said it at the time, I took massive amounts of shit each time. Objectively, those games were barely holding together. You saw all the tape and glue and, you know, cracks and everything like that. You could tell that, like, half the original content on Bioshock Infinite was just thrown out. Same, I think, with, with Last of Us 2. You saw how it was sort of pulled apart and stitched back together. So a level that was probably the original tutorial ends up in the middle of the fucking game. Like, those games were messes. But the games press lauded it. And then, you know, all, all the super fans and the trolls and everything like come out and beat up on anybody who goes, the Emperor has no clothes here. And then, you know, the articles come out later saying, yeah, there were problems with the development of these games. What I, I hope is that these articles start coming out, these even-handed fair articles start coming out sooner so it can actually help the employees on these projects. Uh, and, ho and hopefully this one will. I mean, who knows when this game is coming out. I disagree with Jason Schreier that eight years is a really long time to be making a game. It's on the longer side, but it's not unheard of. Alan Wake 2. Um, you know, but uh, I mean, I think the original Dragon Age was seven, something like that. So Grand, uh, all the Grand Theft Auto games, there is a long time between Grand Theft Auto games, right? There's a lot of what we say in TV, below the line development that happens, you know, pre-development or early like pre-production goes on, the planning and the story. Eight to 10 years isn't that long. It's a long time to be working on something with no end in sight. So, you know, hopefully this, this even-handed article, again, please read it, link in the description box. It's a good start, but we need to stop building these guys up as some sort of example, knowing their poor work habits, because everybody knows them, you know, knowing their poor work habits, the media likes to create narratives where they build somebody up only to tear them down and then they build them up again. Or in my case, they just tear down, tear down, tear down, and I keep bobbing up, you know, cause I'm a scrappy little survivor, but then they tear me down again. Um, but the media loves those cycles because it just fuels, they have to do very little work to tell the rise, the fall, the comeback, the fall, the comeback, right? Why do you think they breathlessly cover all the Johnny Depp stuff? Um, tragic. But, uh, uh, 
you know, enough about breathlessly covering court cases and things like that. Topic for another time. I'm not a fan. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd like the media to stop making rock stars out of these guys despite their poor work habits. I'd like actually being a good manager to matter. And some people just don't have the managerial skills. They're very, very creative, but they don't have the managerial skills. So get a partner that can do it. I know lots of people who are like that, who are like, I'm not real great with people. You know, I find people from my teams that um, let me play to my strengths while backstopping my weaknesses. I mean, Mary Just is an extrovert. I am not. It's very useful, right? <laughs> I'm a lot less exhausted on things because of that. Um, but, uh, you know, let's, starting 2022 off of a positive note, good writing on Jason Schreier's behalf. Let's see more of this truly fair investigative behind the scenes reporting and less of the very clearly biased, they're going to defend Naughty Dog or, or they're going to tear apart CDPR. Like, the, the evenness and, and the sort of um, professional distance in this article is a really nice change for Jason Schreier. And I hope Bloomberg sat on him and said, you know, be a professional and, and this is a sign of things to come. Because it's a good read. All right, everybody. Hope you like this video. You know what I'm going to say again. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching.